So if you are ready, Antoine, I think we can start. All right. So yeah, let's uh, let's resume. Uh, I think um, based on how far we went on the first part, I will skip uh, hopefully momentarily, but I'm not sure the UCQ part, and I'll jump to the hardness result that matches the tractability result we've just seen, because I think in that way. Uh, and that way the connection will, will, will be clearer since we already have this in our in our head so uh what i want to talk about now is uh so we've seen so cell join free conjunctive queries we've seen the hierarchical ones are tractable uh, either via an algorithm or via this uh, computation of a circuit in a restricted formalism and now i want to show you that uh the non-hierarchical self join free CQs are all intractable, so they are sharply hard to evaluate. So for this, sharp P is a class of counting problems. So problems where you get an input and you must produce uh, some, some kind of number, uh, which you can express as uh, the number of accepting paths of a polynomial time non-deterministic Turing machine. So NP, the class NP, which uh, everyone's familiar with, I hope, is you run a non-deterministic p-time Turing machine and you see if there is at least one accepting path. Sharp P is the problems where you want to know how many accepting paths there are. So, uh, so whenever you have an NP problem, you can you can think of the corresponding sharp P problem where you not only ask if the count greater than one, but how many how many accepting paths did you have. Uh, but what's funny with counting problems is that they are uh, p-time decision problems where counting the number of, ex of uh, witnesses is a sharply hard task, and we will see later some of them. So intuitively, uh, looking at counting usually makes dichotomy results easier because uh, less things are tractable in a, in a, in a way. And yeah, so sometimes adding counting makes a decision, a p-time decision problem uh, intractable. Uh, so we know that probabilistic query evaluation is in this class sharp p, assuming that evaluating the query is in p time uh, in the non-probabilistic case. And if you need a proof to see this, basically, um, you have a Turing machine, uh, you can have a, a non-deterministic Turing machine that first guesses evaluation of the probabilistic databases. So it makes non-deterministic non -deterministic guesses to choose a, a specific subworld. And then you evaluate the query on the possible world and you accept or reject the possible world. Since the, the facts have probabilities, you need to uh, do the guesses in a way that like biases the number of accepting runs that you will have. You can, you can do this uh, you, like, using the, when the probabilities are written as rational numbers. And uh, yeah, well, I mean, for, for purists, the, the task is not really in, in sharp p, but in fp to the sharp p, because you need to uh, write a, a probability as an output. Uh, so it's a number of accepting paths normalized by some denominator. But let's just forget about this. So probability query evaluation is in sharp p for all tractable, for all uh, UCQs, for instance. Uh, what we want to show is hardness, so sharp p hardness. Uh, a problem is sharp p hard if every problem in sharp p reduces to it uh, by a p time reduction. So we're talking about Turing reductions where you can invoke the oracle uh, many times. And uh, I don't exactly care about this definition. I'm just using as a black box. I mean, as usual with hardness reductions, I have my my toolkit of sharp p hard problems that I just need to reduce from one of them to get hardness, and, and that's all. Uh, we will see one or hopefully two sharp p hard problems. Um, so it's called the sharp PP2 DNF problem. Uh, so it's uh, satisfiability uh, in the counting framework, uh, counting the number of satisfying assignments for formulas in a very restricted shape. So the input to that problem, you have variables, Boolean variables, and they are partitioned between the X variables and the Y variables. And the formula is a formula in positive partitioned to DNF. So this means partitioned, uh, each clause has one X and one Y variable. Uh, two means there are like these, each clause is two variables, one X and one Y. And DNF means it's a, it's a disjunction of these clauses and positive means there is no negation anywhere. So the formula is just something like this. Uh, you have an example just here. 
So uh, uh, this junction of conjunctions of two variables, one is an X and one, the other one is a Y. So this is an example of a problem where the decision variant is easy, right? Deciding if you can satisfy this uh, is trivial because there's no negation, right? So you just make everything true. But counting the number of satisfying assignments is sharply hard. Yeah, this is the, 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 the problem that we use. So this example here, so this is a formula. We will often represent the formulas as bipartite graphs like this. You have the x's to the left and the y's to the, to the right, and you have a connecting edge for each clause. And well, if you ex if you exhaustively count, and well, since it's sharply hard, we don't know much better ways. You see that there are eight satisfying assignments out of the possible sixteen for that for for that uh, for this PP two DNF formula. Uh, equivalently, the number of violating assignments, so an assignment that does not satisfy the formula, corresponds to an independent set of this bipartite graph. So the negation of that problem is counting. So counting the falsifying assignments means counting the, the independent sets of the bipartite graph. It's also sharply hard, right? There are two to the number of variables, possible assignments. And so it's polynomially equivalent to count the satisfying ones and count the falsifying ones. And here you see again a difference with decision, like when decision problems, uh, satisfiability and, uh, and and validity are not the same, for, uh, um, like, do not reduce to, uh, to one another um, when you have an NP and co -NP. For counting, it's, the same, it's the, the same, counting satisfying and counting falsifying assignments. So to, it's hard to count independent sets in the bipartite graph. It's hard to count satisfying assignments of this kind of formula. And this is the same problem in a, in a different uh, costume. Okay. So let's reduce from this problem to show the hardness of probabilistic reevaluation for some non-hierarchical self joint free conductive queries. And let's do this so for my favorite uh, query, which is the simplest intractable uh, uh, self joint free conductive query. Remember this one, the was that was not hierarchical, right? Because I couldn't pick a root variable. Uh, so the, the three atoms are connected. So if I want to quantify over something, either it's X and it's not in all atoms, or it's Y and it's not in all atoms either. Let's see why this query, uh, like probability correlation for this query is sharply hard. And for this, let's just code a bipartite, uh, like a PP2 DNF instance into it. So remember the PP2 DNF instance, I can think of it as a bipartite graph between the X's and the, and the Y's. And I just code it as this tuple independent database here with like the X's correspond to R facts that have probability one half. So the, R, the presence of the R fact means the corresponding variable is true. The T facts have probability one half and same thing for the Y's. And I have one S fact with probability one for each clause. And then uh, I hope it's clear to everyone that uh, the probability uh, that the PP2 DNF formula is satisfied, so it's, non it's proportion of satisfying assignments, is exactly the, the number of possible worlds here that satisfy the query. Because having an RST pattern means having kept an X and a Y that were together in a clause and that said that witness this, the, that the formula is true. I hope this is, uh, this is reasonable to you guys. Uh, note that I, I've used so for the middle facts, since they code, they code the clauses, the middle facts were not probabilistic. So this is why this would not work for uniform reliability as we'll talk again in a second. But for probabilistic query evaluation with probabilities just uh, one half and, and, uh, and and one, we can we can do this, uh, this simple reduction. Uh, if you have it. if you have questions, let me know because of <laughs> we're going to do worse uh, soon. So a, a variant of the yes question. So it's not entirely clear for me. So in this uh, sharp PP two DNF instance, you yeah. have a bunch of this XI, YI. Yeah. Which means uh, some of this is like a disjunction, a disjunction, or in yes, it's a disjunction. So sorry, let me let me uh, let, 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 let me work out an example. I think this will be the, the simplest. So if I can remove that stuff. Uh, go go away. Uh, ah, let me try and get rid of this monstrous thing. Okay, so this 
uh, this thing here. So this pi pi type graph corresponds to that for, uh, damn. corresponds to that formula. So x1 and y1 or x2 and y1 or x2 and y2. Okay. Is that clear? Yeah. Yeah, that and so now the co the coding means I have R of A one, R of A two, with probabilities one half, standing for the choice of whether to make X one and X two true or false, T of B one, T and B of B two, with probability one half again, and I have the following S facts with probability one. So I mean, in writing, there would be a, a, S of A1, B1, uh, S of A2, B1, and S of A2, B2, with probability one. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so now, and so now you see that the, the counting the number of satisfying assignments of, of this thing is uh, counting the probability that I have an RST path in this uh, probability database. Yeah, uh, yeah. thanks. Sure. Well, thank, thanks for, for telling me that you, you didn't get it because I'm sure you were not the only one. You're, you're the one. That, and I have. I can. I can see Philip, and I can see you. I cannot see the, the other participants, <laughs> but I'm assuming that if I cannot see them, the probability that they understood is is lower. <laughs> Let's say. Uh, and uh, so the, the same proof works for queries of this form, and it's not that it's especially interesting, but I will need it later. So if I have a query that contains R atoms like this and uh, S atoms like this and T atoms like this, I can do the exact same proof. I just, uh, I, I do the same proof with R1, S1, T1 and the other, uh, the other facts, I just give them probability one half. So I, I mean, in the example, it means I just add here uh, R2 of A1 with probability one and I do the same here. And I do the same with T and uh, I do the same with, uh, and I do the same with S. So if I have, sorry, with probability one half, you add it or or one with one because the one half is already carried by uh, by R one. Because to have a match, I need all of the R facts and all of the S facts and all of the T facts. So so I can give the the other like the R two S two T two facts for free, and then the the problem is just looking at the R facts. Okay. Does that make sense? I'm lost a bit, but <laughs> no, so let's see. So I have R1x, R2x, I have T1, uh, T1y, T2y, and I have S1 of xy, S2 of xy. And you see that to make the reduction, uh, so I, I actually I, I don't care about these relations here. I just want to use the one relations. But to make sure that I get the query matches that I need, I just put these facts for free in the instance everywhere where I could need them, but so with probability one. And so now the whether x is uh, whether x one is true or, or false is dependent on whether r one of a one holds or not. That has probability one half, and the r two fact is always here. So I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one which have problems here, but I'm kind of confused. What do we reduce to what now? So now I'm saying I can reduce I can reduce sharp PQ2 DNF mm -hmm. to PQE for for that query with R1 R2 S1 S2 T1 T2 by doing the same reduction as before, but sprinkling uh, like adding facts R2 S2 and T2 everywhere with probability one. Mm -hmm. Because uh, this way, the, the probabilistic facts are the R1 facts on the left and the T1 facts on the right that, that describe the, whether the x's and y's are true or false. And if I have a satisfying assignment to the PP2 DNF formula, I have the R1 and T1 facts connected by an S1 fact, and I have the R2 and T2 and S2 facts for free. So your goal is actually to have R1 of X times R2 of X to be one half. 
Yes, yes, precisely. And the, the cheapest way to guarantee this is to say R2 is always one and R1 is not half. Okay, but in principle, you could say, I don't know, um, R1. I could put one over square root of two for okay. both if I wanted. The idea being that I need both to make the query true. Okay, okay. So I, I thought the one, this one was the simplest to understand. So I didn't say uh, two to the minus uh, n or two to the minus one over n or something, but it's it's asymmetric and you're right that this is a completely arbitrary choice. Okay, thanks. Fine. Fine. Okay. Sure. Uh, so I mean, this, it's not that these queries are especially interesting, but they, 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 will, show up, uh, they will show up in a second. Okay. So now uh, let's show so Sharpie hardness uh, for all the non-hierarchical self-joint free CQs. And this hinges on a, uh, on a different phrasing of the hierarchicality condition. Uh, it so happens that uh, when we say that this uh, self-joint free CQ is hierarchical, uh, we can see it equivalently in that, in that way. So now if we, we forget about where the quantifiers are, we just look at the query with, the, with, with its variables. And for every variable, I write atoms of X to mean the set of atoms containing that variable. So here for that query, atoms of X means uh, R of X, uh, like X is only in the atom R, Y is in the atoms, um, oh, sorry, I messed that up, obviously. Uh, so sorry, this is atoms Y and this is atoms X. Uh, no, no, what did I do? Ah, this is completely false, sorry. So atoms of, I mean, I will just write it again. Atoms of X is R of X, S of X, Y. Atoms of Y is just S of X, Y. So the inclusion relationship is in that direction. And atoms of Z is just T of Z, okay? And it's, the query is hierarchical if and only if the following is true about the atoms sets. For any two variables, the sets are either disjoint or compa comparable, meaning one is included in the other. You cannot have two overlapping sets that, like, that have a non-empty intersection, but, uh, but none, none is included in the other. So for this bad query, for instance, the RST query, you have X in two atoms and, and Y in two atoms, and one atom is shared between the two, and the two sets are incomparable. So let's see why this is an equivalent uh, definition of hierarchical. So if I have a hierarchical query, why do I get this condition on the sets? So well, when I have only, it's an inductive proof on the query. If I have only one atom, it's obvious. If I have an existential quantification, it's not changing the sets atom of, uh, of X, so that's not the interesting part. If I have a conjunction, uh, there are several possibilities. So say I have a, a subformula, which is a conjunction, and the, the, if I take a variable X, so the simple cases are, if it only occurs in, um, uh, sorry, I take two variables, X and Y, and I compare atoms of X and atoms of Y. Okay, uh, if X and Y only occur in Q1, I conclude by induction hypothesis because atoms of, uh, of X and atoms of Y is uh, what was uh, the, the same thing as in Q1, which by assumption satisfied the condition. If it's only in Q2, same thing. If X and Y, uh, the X only occurs in Q1, in Q1 and Y only occurs in Q2, uh, then the, at the sets of atoms for X and for Y are disjoint, so they satisfy the condition. And now, if one of the variables, say X, occurs both in Q1 and in Q2, it means that it's going to be quantified above in the formula, and when it is quantified, it will have to occur in all atoms. So we know that actually then X occurs in all possible atoms in Q1 and in Q2, and so it cannot be a counterexample because uh, like uh, the Atoms of X is all the possible atoms. So atoms of Y cannot be incomparable to that set. It's necessarily a subset of it, okay? So you can see, I mean, if, if you look at the, this, again, at the example of a hierarchical CQ here, you can persuade yourself that when, when you pick two variables of the query, basically two, yeah. So say pick these two variables, the sets of atoms are independent and pick, uh, I mean, these two here, it's again independent. 
but then pick two that are related in a way. And then you see Z is contained only in the dark green thing and, and uh, Y is contained in dark green and light green. And so one is included in the other. Conversely, if the, uh, the sets atoms of X and atoms of Y are always either included in one another or disjoint, then um, uh, we can do the following thing. We can take the variables that achieve the maximal sets atoms uh, here. So here I have an example here of like, a, I, have per, I have variables and for each variable, I have a set of atoms uh, that are the atoms that contain the variable in question. And I have ordered them by inclusion and we have by assumption the, like uh, all sets are either comparable or disjoint. So it has a shape like that. And to write a hierarchical formula, I will basically quantify, I mean, I'm going to do a, a conjunction of that part and that part, which don't share any atom by hypothesis. And in, on each part, I'm going to quantify over the root variables like this, and to write the atoms that only occur in that, uh, the, the atoms uh, that only use this, this variable. Um, so, and, and I get, so, for the second part, I get this. So I quantify U and V and I write the atom A5. For the left part, I quantify X and Y and I write the atom A4. And now I recursively process this. Okay. And this way I can uh, I can get a hierarchical expression for my uh, for, for my formula. So if if this, if this this didn't make sense to you, it's not too important. You can just assume the result if you prefer. So I'm just saying hierarchicality of a CQ can be checked by looking at the sets of uh, atoms for each variable and checking that the, there are no incomparable sets, uh, no no two variables that are giving comparable sets. So thanks to this, if I have a non-hierarchical query, so one that I cannot process with the previous algorithm. There are two variables that are a counterexample. So the two variables, there is an atom that uses both variables, and there is an atom using one variable but not the other, and one variable using uh, one atom using one variable but not the not, not, not the other. So uh, if this is atoms of X and atoms of Y. We know that the two sets, they intersect. So there is something here and we know that they are not, the none is included in the other. So there is something here and there is something there. And I call the set of all atoms here R, I call this T and I call this, uh, here, I call it S. You see where I'm getting, right? This is starting to look a lot like the RST query. Huh? And this is exactly what we're gonna show. So if I have a self-joint free conjunctive query and I have these non-empty sets of atoms using uh, R is just using X, S is using X and Y, T is just using Y, I can basically do the reduction. So uh, I can reduce from probabilistic query evaluation for the query that was R1 of, uh, of X, R of cardinality of R of X. So the number of R relations depends on the cardinality of that set. And likewise for S1 to uh, S1, XY, S card S, uh, XY, T1, Y, card T of card T, uh, Y. Okay. And the only problem when doing this reduction, so reducing from that query to the query here, is that there might be other variables than X and Y, right? And that we're not seeing. And so to do the reduction, uh, I'm just basically taking an instance for that query and I'm enlarging it uh, by adding, uh, add, so I just take a new constant, I choose a new domain element, C, and I just enlarge the facts of my instance for that query by adding this additional constant to fill all of the positions uh, that need to be filled. So, Let's look at an example. I think it's more enlightening. Let's take this query here. This is not a hierarchical query, and this is uh, the reason why. So if you take X and Y, the atoms that contain X, it's uh, these ones, and the atoms uh, that contain, uh, oops, the example is, what did I do? Sorry, this shouldn't be X, obviously, it should be something else. 
Let me cheat a second. Sorry about that. So this is the query. The atoms that contain X are underlined in black. The atoms that contain Y are here and here. And you see the two sets are incomparable. So the black things are R, the, the, the pink things are T, and the things that are both black and, and pink are S. And uh, if I had an instance for the query R1, R2, S1, T1, I just enlarge it to add, uh, so I just added uh, C at the positions where I had the variable that I didn't care about. So here, this variable is always W, but it could be some other variable, it doesn't matter. So I'm just enlarging my instance here to be on the right signature in a sense. And the other thing fix I need to do is that there might be atoms that use it, that use neither X nor Y. And to, for this query here to have a chance of being true, I need to add these atoms, uh, sorry, facts for these atoms, and I just add them with the constant C. So I just create one fact with probability one for every relation, not in RST, with the constant C and with probability one. And in that way, you can check that the possible worlds of the initial instance here for the query uh, R1, R2, S1, T1, which we know is hard, there's a bijection between the possible worlds of this instance and the, the possible worlds of that instance, because the probabilistic facts are just the enlargements of the initial probabilistic facts. And that whenever you have a possible world here that satisfies the query, then the possible world here also satisfies the original query using these, uh, these, these uh, extra facts to complete the query match. And conversely, if I have a match, uh, then it's the it's uh, it, it's image in the original instance here is a match of the other queries, so it's actually equivalent. So uh, if I if 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 I try to summarize the high level idea, of, and if you if, even if you got lost in the technical details, when you have a non hierarchical self joint free CQ uh, for which the algorithm doesn't work. There are two variables and you have these atoms like using the two variables, using just one, using just the other. And you can restrict attention to these two variables by just filling the other positions with a constant and just adding the other facts that, are, that don't use these, these two variables. And now the behavior of that query specialized to these two variables when filling everything else with a constant is the same thing as the, is, as the, same thing of the, as the RST query, so the non-hierarchical query from before or one of its variants where you have multiple R's and multiple S's and multiple T's, okay? So this means we have uh, settled the case of uh, self-joint-free conjunctive queries. Uh, we have, um, so we have shown that uh, either the, if you have a self-joint-free conjunctive query, either it's hierarchical and you can solve probabilistic correlation in P time on every instance, even by building a circuit if you so desire, or it's sharply hard by reduction from one of the hard queries itself by reduction from the pp 2 dnf problem. So uh, before the break, I want to give you a taste of uniform reliability. So can we do the same hardness proof, but using probabilities one half only? And if you remember, uh, the reduction uses probability one at some place specifically, uh, let's go to where the probability one here. I'm using probability one here for the, for the middle edges. And that's what's, uh, so uh, if I don't have probability one, can I still do the reduction? And the answer is yes, we can make it work. And uh, we're just going to show this for the RST query here and essentially that suffices. So let's show that uniform reliability for this for this query is uh, is sharp p hard, okay. And so let's reduce from counting the independent sets of a bipartite graph. So this is counting the violating assignments of a PP two DNF formula. So you input a bipartite graph and output how many vertex subsets are an independent set of the of the bipartite graph. For this. Uh, I mean, the, the proof technique is, uh, is I think, interesting and it's, it's commonly used in counting problems. So I, I, I hope it can be something uh, 
interesting to, to take away to be for you to be familiar, familiarized with that technique. We want to count, uh, so we have the bipartite graph. And we want to count vertex subsets that are an independent set. So something like this. Uh, we're going to talk about all possible subsets of vertices of the bipartite graph, and we will partition them based on some quantities, such that the thing we're interested in, the independent sets, they are a union of some of these subsets. So we'll, instead of just counting the independent sets, we will count the number of vertex subsets of different types that suffices, to, and these types tell us whether we are an independent set or not. And now we, we are going to do this by a reduction. Um, so we are going to reduce this, um, this problem of counting the, the cardinalities of the xi's to um, a problem, uh, a probabilistic query evaluation problem. So a, a probabilistic query evaluation for the query RST. Okay. Um, we're going to do that, but since we have several quantities, we want to know all of these cardinalities, x0, xi, and so forth, we need to reduce to several problem instances, right? We cannot hope to get all of these values by just doing one Oracle call. We will do multiple Oracle calls. So we will code our original graph in several different ways, uh, up to uh, some degree of freedom. And so we will build several instances like this as many as we have sets, and we will call the oracle on each of them. And then we will say that the oracle answers, so the probabilities of this hard query on these, uh, these instances, these oracle calls are related to the quantities that we want, the cardinalities of the xi's, by a, as a linear equation system. So we're going to have a linear equation system between, on the one hand, the, the oracle values that we received. So we received from the oracle some values n0 to uh, np, which are a, a matrix times the values that we're interested in, the cardinalities of x0, cardinality of xn. And we will see how this can be done. And um, if we do this, then if we can argue that the matrix of this linear equation system is invertible, it means that we can recover this, which is what we need to complete the reduction, from that, which is what we get from the oracle, okay? So this is the, the general reduction technique. So how does the reduction technique proceed? Um, so I need to explain these four steps. So how will I, part, how will I split the subsets of vertices of my bipartite graph? Uh, based on which information am I going to split them, and then which coding of the graph am I going to do, and then how the how can I relate what I what I get from the oracle and what I uh, what I want to compute. So take the the bipartite graph, which is an input to the to the reduction. So this is the bipartite graph the, in green. Uh, I will draw it without the the red things again. So we have this uh, this bipartite graph. And uh, consider one subset of vertices, so written in red. So we have a, a subset R prime of left vertices and a subset T prime of right vertices. The, the quant what I call the important quantities of R prime and T prime, so these, uh, these subsets here, are how many edges do I have of each type? So how many edges do I have that do not have any, any incident vertex selected? How many have exactly one vertex selected and how many have exactly two vertices selected? So on this, uh, on this graph, so let, let, let me do, do the example uh, by, by hand. So on, on, this graph, uh, on this graph here, if I take this, these vertices, for instance, how many, do, how, many vertices, how many edges of each type do I get? So for zero, zero, I have this one here and, uh, and that's it. So I have one edge with two vertices not selected. I have uh, one, two edges with exactly one uh, vertex selected. And I have one, two, uh, 
two, two edges with both vertices selected. Okay, so this means that, um, so in fact, I mean, it looks like I have three quantities for, for R prime and T prime, but in fact, the three quantities sum to the number of edges. So they are like two degrees of freedom, if that helps. So now I will partition the subsets of vertices based on these values. So a subset of vertices has one type, you know, the number, the cardinalities of the 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1 types. And I can write a disjoint, a disjoint union like that. And if I want to know if a given subset of vertices is an independent set, I'm just asking if the 1, 1 type is equal to 0, right? I'm just asking if there are no edges of that form. So this means that the cardinality, the, so the, I'm reducing from counting independent sets. So the quantity that I need to obtain to conclude the, the reduction is this, uh, the number of independent sets. And this is the number of, of vertex subsets having a type where there are no edges with two incident vertices. So basically, I'm just making my life harder here. Like my task is to compute this x here, the number of independent sets. And I'm just making things harder for myself by saying instead I will compute all of the x, i, j, k. So how many vertex subsets are there that have uh, I, I edges with no incident vertices, j edges with one incident vertex, and k edges with uh, two incident vertices. And what I actually care about is just the, the sum of these where, um, where k equals zero. So I'm just making, ma making my life harder, but this is because it makes the rest of the proof simpler. And now let's see how we can code our bipartite graph uh, here to a probabilistic query evaluation instance. So to an instance for the query R of X, S of X, Y, T of Y. The hope is that uh, the number of possible worlds satisfying the query gives me some information about the number of independent sets, okay? Or, or on the cardinalities of the X, I, J, K. This, this sounds a bit crazy, but we, we, we will actually be able to find such a connection. And so the easy coding would be that one, okay? This is what we did in the hardness proof. So if I have this bipartite graph, we said we just code it as this RST instance, but this is just one instance. And since I need to get X, I, J, K, I want to have several different instances and make several different Oracle codes. So what can vary? So I cannot change the probabilities of the facts because now I'm doing uniform reliability. So all of the facts have probability one half. So what I, I, I would like to do uh, something where like I add uh, one or two or three or four or many S edges as the kind of different instances I would consider, but I'm not allowed to do this because it's the same fact. So I cannot have the same fact multiple times. Well, otherwise this would be cheating, right? It would make the probability different from one half. So instead I do the, I do the next best thing. I code every edge like this as back and forth paths like this. May I have so one? one edge becomes, uh, sorry, Vertex, are you saying something? Uh, I have a question. I think my sound just cut off and I think it's my fault. Wait to see. Sorry, Vertex, you were saying? Can you hear you? Can you hear me now? Yes, I think my, my, head, my headset just died, but I can hear you with uh, speakers now. So just a simple question. I got lost a bit. So what is the problem which is sharp p hard and from which you reduce now? Yes, so I'm reducing sharp pp to dnf. One more time, the same one. Well, so not I'm not exactly doing this. I'm re reducing from counting independent sets of a bipartite graph. Aha, and this is known to be sharp p uh, sharp p hard. Yes, because it's it's actually the it's actually almost the same thing as PP two DNF. So if you have a bipartite graph, PP two DNF asks how many choices of, of true variables do I have mm -hmm. that that where there is an edge having two selected uh, variables, and counting independent sets is how many subsets of vertices do I have 
where there is no edge of that former. So basically, uh, it's like, like the complement. Okay, it's the complement. And since I know the total cardinality is uh, the, the total number of subsets, then counting one is key time equivalent to counting the other. Sure. Okay. So, so we are reducing this to uniform reliability for the, the query uh, Rx, uh, Sxy, Ty. And in fact, I'm not exactly reducing this, I'm reducing the, the, the more challenging problem of counting the, uh, counting the X, uh, So I want to say that uh, <clears throat> because uh, so what reduces to what actually? So this reduces to this. So if I want to compute the independent sets of a bipartite graph, so this is computing the, the ijk where k is equal to 0, reduces to this, this problem of counting the, the, e, the cardinality of each xijk. And this is what we're reducing to uniform reliability. And since it's the problem of com computing many quantities, we need to do many Oracle calls for that thing. And now I'm explaining, given a graph on which we want to count the x, i, j, k, what are the Oracle calls that I will make? And so what are the, the codings of this bipartite graph on which I will call the Oracle? And the answer is, uh, I do the, the usual coding, but instead of having just one edge, I have a gadget here where I have p copies of the path going back and forth. Uh, so just because I want to, to, to have query matches all over the place. So this is why the, the gadget looks like this. And the parameter, I will call the Oracle for different values of p. So, and then this will make many more, many Oracle calls. And we're going to see how this gives me information about the xijks. Okay. So I'm not close to the end of that proof and it's already time for a break. So I would propose we make a, a, the break now um, unless you have questions. Okay, we can proceed with a break. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you're welcome to use again the, the, the form in particular if you got lost about that proof. Uh, and I don't want to resume uh, continuing the proof that no, no one's following. So uh, if you're lost about it, tell me if you would like me to, to start over or if you would like, like me to, to try something else, or I don't know. And in any case, let's resume at uh, 4.20. Yeah.